Good morning. Welcome to our gathering of Southside Baptist this morning. I'm glad to see you here today. I hope you're ready to worship the Lord together. Uh, it's always a joy and a privilege to worship God uh, with our church family, and I hope that we never, ever, ever take that for granted. Um, just a couple of reminders. You should have seen them um, on our announcement slides, but just want to make sure you uh, know we've got a child protection policy training coming up on Wednesday evening. If you um, need to come to that and you weren't able to come to the one last week, we encourage you to try to be at that one, um, if at all possible. And then also just a reminder about our uh, associational men's ministry event tomorrow evening. Um, and uh, we'll be out of the lake and looking forward to that time. If you have questions about that, uh, it'll be pretty much normal. There'll be a few changes this year just in regards to everything that's going on. Uh, but uh, with, uh, with the virus, but, uh, but it'll be a similar event to what we've had in the past out there. Uh, it's going to be an awesome speaker that's coming to share with us. I'm excited. I've heard him speak before, um, and I was excited to be able to get him to come uh, to speak to the men uh, tomorrow evening. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Uh, I want to read a passage from uh, Psalm 119. Uh, one of the things that I'm supposed to do as a pastor is read scripture to you. Um, I don't know if you know that or not, but that's one, of, that's one of my assignments from God in his word is that I'm supposed to publicly read scripture. And so that's one of the, one of the reasons, um, not only because I love God's word, and I hope you do as well, um, that I enjoy uh, kind of starting our services out reading scripture, but also because I'm commanded to, to read scripture. And, and I think, uh, I think uh, just starting out with a passage helps get our minds focused on who God is. This is God's revelation of himself to us. Psalm 119 is all about the word. So the whole, cha- the whole book, uh, excuse me, the whole chapter, uh, Psalm 119, it's a long chapter, it's all about the Word of God. And uh, over the past several weeks, I've read a couple of passages from this. I want to read another passage from Psalm 119 as we uh, get ready to move into a time of prayer. I'm going to start in verse 17 and read through verse 24. God's Word says this in Psalm 119, Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, what incredible words. Father, this isn't our passage that we're going to be studying today, uh, but it is full of truths. And and Lord, what a great psalm to read before before we do come to your word to study it and to seek to understand it and to apply it to our lives. Father, would would you open our eyes that we would behold wondrous things out of your law? Father, even today, in just a few minutes, as we, as we look at some commands that you have given us, Lord, um, even though you have saved us by your grace and we are not under the law, Father, because of your grace, we now have hearts that desire to follow you and to follow the commands that you give us. And so, Father, would you open our eyes that we would behold wondrous things out of your law? Father, that verse there that says that my soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Lord, would that, would that be true of us today? Father, would our souls be consumed with longing for your rules, your statutes, your, your word? Lord, would that, that completely overtake us today? That there would be nothing more important in our lives than, than coming to your word and feasting upon your word, learning from it. And Lord, then going out, doing what your word calls us to do. And Father, that verse that says, your testimonies are my delight, they are my counselors. Father, again, will we delight in your testimonies, in your word. And Father, would that be our counselors? Lord, there's so many voices in our lives that would speak to us. Lord, there's so many, um, so many paths that we could choose to walk down moment by moment, day by day. And Father, there's voices in our world that are calling us one way and calling us another. They're giving us counsel. And yet, Father, 
true counsel comes only from you. True, true wisdom. Father, the right way comes from you. And so, Father, would your testimonies be our counselors today? Father, your words, your words from your word that you have given to us, Father, would that be where we run to, to, to find out who you are and who we are and what you desire of us in this life? Father, would you help us in this today? Father, we lift up our church family. Father, we thank you that you know every single need and you are able to meet every single need in accordance with your will and for the good of your children. We pray for that, Father. Lord, we lift up our, our community and our state and our nation. Father, in our world, God, we ask for uh, peace. Lord, you tell us in your word to pray for peace. And Lord, we ask for that, Lord. We know that true peace only comes from Jesus Christ. But Father, when, when rulers and leaders in our, on our earthly, in this earthly, temporary world, Lord, make decisions that are right and lead to peace between people, Lord, it's, it's more advantageous for the gospel of peace going out. And so, Father, we pray for that today. Father, I lift up anyone who is here today who is burdened. Father, who is hurting in some way. Father, I pray that you would, you would touch them with your love and your mercy and your compassion in a very special way today. Father, if there's someone here who doesn't know Jesus, their Lord and Savior, we pray for salvation for that individual. Father, if there's someone here today who's just struggling in their walk with you, Father, we pray that you would lift them up, that you would encourage them, that you would teach them. Father, we pray that we would all worship you in spirit and in truth today, exalting Jesus Christ as a Savior and Lord of all. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. encourage you to open up in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to jump into our time of the preaching of the Word today and then uh, always look forward to getting to respond in worship to God's Word. Whenever we study God's Word, it, it leads us to want to worship Him. And so uh, we'll get to do that um, through song at the end of the service. But now we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The title of our message today is The Church, A Gathering of Gospel Worship. It's part two of where we were last week. The Church, A Gathering of Gospel Worship. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 22. I want to begin by reading this passage of Scripture. So church, if you would follow along in your copy of God's Word, this is the Word of God. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. This is the word of the Lord. Have you ever heard someone say, don't leave your mind at the door? Have you ever heard somebody say that? I don't think I just made that up. I think I've heard that before. Maybe not. Maybe I made it up. Don't leave your mind at the door. Maybe, maybe I've been told that before because I walked into a setting where I should have been thinking and I was clueless as to what was going on and somebody said, don't leave your mind at the door, bring it with you. I think I've heard that somewhere, I don't know. What does that mean? Well, I think it means we should turn our minds on rather than turn them off. We should think, discern, evaluate, and consider. Perhaps you've heard this much more familiar saying. Maybe you've heard a teacher say, now kids, it's time to put your thinking caps on, right? Time to put your thinking caps on. Church, today's passage is a call to put on our thinking caps and to leave them on. To put them on and leave them on. It is a call to not leave our minds at the door, but to use our minds to ensure that we are a church that can be described as a gathering of gospel worship. Now, as Paul writes this last main section of 1 Thessalonians, we see him give this string of commands. When you read it, it's kind of choppy. It's just kind of short little verses that one command after another. 
And these commands, uh, verses 12 through 22, I think are meant to help the Thessalonian church be a healthy church for the glory and mission of Jesus. Now, in verses 12 through 15, we saw that the church is a gathering of gospel relationships. And now, as we've been studying verses 16 through 22, we're seeing that the church is also a gathering of gospel worship. Now, last week, we studied verses 16, 17, and 18, and we learned that a healthy church is filled with members who worship gods with hearts that have been transformed by the gospel. Now today in verses 19 through 22, we want to learn this, that a healthy church is filled with members who worship God with minds grounded in the gospel. So last week, we worship God with hearts that have been transformed by the gospel. This week in these verses, we learn that we worship God with minds that uh, that are grounded in the gospel. And one of the many ways a local church can get off track and ultimately fail in accomplishing the mission of God is for those who belong to that church to fail to worship God with their minds. Unfortunately, when we think about worshiping God, we often just think about hearts of worship, which that's not a bad thing. We ought to think about hearts of worship. But sometimes we think about hearts of worship to the neglect of thinking about minds of worship. We we forget that we're to worship God also with our minds. Church, when we gather for worship, we're not to leave our minds at the door. Likewise, when we worship God individually throughout the week, We're to do so using our minds, not neglecting our minds. To worship God with our minds, then our minds must stay grounded in the gospel. Now, the gospel is simply this. It's the good news that God saves sinners through the death of Jesus Christ in our place. Everyone who believes in Jesus for salvation is rescued from their sin. It's a very simple statement of the gospel, and we know that that, that we can go a lot deeper and deeper into the truths of the gospel. But but we want to stay grounded in that message. To be grounded means to be rooted or stuck or firmly planted so as not to be moved. Church, we must not be moved away from the truth of the gospel, which means we have to do this. We have to think. We have to think well. We have to think with discernment, and we must think this way all of the time. Because the enemy is always wanting to get our minds off track when it comes to the truth of the gospel. And then as we use our gospel-minded, uh, grounded minds, excuse me, to constantly discern truth from error, what's going to happen is we'll worship God appropriately and we will live on mission for Jesus Christ. If we're not worshiping God with our minds, we're not going to be worshiping God, uh, or our not, minds are not grounded in the gospel, and we won't be accomplishing the mission that he has called us to. Now let me share with you three ways from this passage today that we ought to worship God with minds grounded in the gospel. Church, when our minds are grounded in the gospel, we will, number one, approach teachings with dependence upon the Spirit. We need to approach teachings with dependence upon the Spirit. We see this in verse 19. Verse 19 is one of those short commands. We have this choppy, lots of short little commands. Verse 19 says, do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, to understand verse 19 in its context, I think we have to look ahead for just a moment and see that the commands in verses 20 through 22 are very obviously dealing with discerning false teaching from true teaching. And we'll look at that in more detail in just a minute. But we need to know that's what's coming in verses uh, 20 through 22 because we want to interpret verse 19 in that context of discerning false teaching from true teaching. So here in verse 19, Paul uses an analogy of a fire being put out. He talks about quenching the Spirit. He compares the Spirit, which is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to fire. Now, that's an appropriate analogy because if you go back to Acts 2, the Holy Spirit came upon the the apostles and disciples there. Um, It looked to those who were watching as fire resting upon them. The Holy Spirit appeared as though it were fire. So it's a great analogy for Paul to use here as well. Now, Here's what Paul's not saying. He's not saying that we have the ability to completely snuff out the Holy Spirit. Like, we can do something and the Holy Spirit is just gone. He just ceases to exist. The Holy Spirit's God, okay? We can't do that. So that's not what he means by quenching the Spirit. We can, though, quench the work of the Spirit in our lives by failing to submit to the Spirit. Every person who has received salvation through faith in Jesus has been filled with the Holy Spirit. That happens the moment that you trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. God fills you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us live lives of Christ-exalting worship. So we've got to depend upon the Spirit every moment of every day. But when we fail to depend upon the Spirit to guide us and help us and sanctify us, we'll find ourselves running off course as Christians. We're not 
following the guiding of the Holy Spirit, we'll find ourselves running off course. A failure to depend upon the Spirit is here described as quenching the Spirit. Now we have to ask this question. What does the Spirit have to do with us having minds that are grounded in the gospel so that we can discern truth from error? What, exactly how does the Spirit help us in that? Well, we want to look at one of the roles of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does a lot of things in our lives. We want to look at one of the things that the Holy Spirit does. Now, um, let me summarize it this way, then I'm going to give you a few verses of Scripture. Um, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to guide us away from what is false and into what is true. If you're wondering today, what is the Holy Spirit doing inside of me today? One of the things the Holy Spirit is doing is he's guiding you away from what is false and into what is true when it comes to the things of God. Now, if you'll think back to the night that Jesus was arrested, um, he, had this, uh, he had this long conversation with his, his disciples, and we get this conversation recorded for us in the book of John. And, and he promised his disciples in that conversation that although he was going to leave them, he was going to send a helper to help them. And this helper was none other than the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And let me read a few statements. You can go back on your own and read John chapter 14, you really start in, verse, uh, in chapter 13, but specifically chapter 14, chapter 15, and chapter 16, you can learn a lot about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read like one verse from each of those three chapters, okay? Just give us a sampling. John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said this, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So just very simply, we're not diving into the details, but we see here in this verse, Jesus saying the Holy Spirit is a teacher. One of the things the Holy Spirit does is teaches us. Now, let me skip ahead uh, a whole chapter. We go to chapter 15, verse 26. And Jesus said this, same conversation. He says, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Now, here we see in John chapter 15, verse 26, that the Spirit is called the Spirit of truth, and that he will bear witness about Jesus. And here's what that means. Uh, the Holy Spirit will tell the truth about who Jesus is. And he'll teach us that, going back to chapter 14, verse 26. Now let me add one more verse. John chapter 16, verse 13. John chapter 16, verse 13. Jesus said this, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you to all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So here we see that the Spirit is going to help guide the disciples into what is true. So let's kind of put all of those, this kind of sampling of, of that conversation together. And we clearly see that one of the roles of the Spirit is to help disciples know and understand what is true when it comes to the things of God. It's one of the things that the Spirit does. It helps us know and understand what is true when it comes to the things of God. Now let's bring this, let's go out of John and bring it back to 1 Thessalonians for, for, for a few minutes. If Paul is calling, in 1 Thessalonians, if Paul is calling the church to worship God with their minds by discerning truth from error, which he is, and we'll clearly see that in the next few verses, and if God is against all that is false, which he is because God is true, and if the Holy Spirit who lives within us is working to guide us away from what is false and into what is true, which we just saw from John is exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing, then we're left with two options. Either we depend upon the Holy Spirit to help guide our minds, which will lead us to believing what is true and rejecting what is false, or we will believe whatever we want to believe, regardless of the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that's like throwing water on the blaze of the Spirit inside of us. It's quenching the Spirit. So if we choose option one, dependence upon the Spirit, then we will be worshiping God with our minds, and our church will be mentally prepared to share the truth of the gospel with a lost world around us. However, if we choose option two, not depending upon the Spirit, or what this verse calls quenching the Spirit, we will fail to worship God with our minds, and our church will be mentally unprepared to shine the truth of the gospel. In fact, if we share anything and we're believing what is false, we're going to be sharing what is false to a dark world, which is just going to lead them even further into darkness, instead of shining the light of the gospel. So church, we must depend upon the Spirit as we seek to stay grounded in gospel truth. This is good news, though. We, church, when it comes to discerning truth from error, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Isn't that good news? It's not just me and how smart I am. I, I, would, I would be in, in a lot of trouble if it was up to me. But I'm so thankful God has filled me with the Holy Spirit so that I can discern 
truth from error. And the same spirit that he fills me with, he fills you with, and he fills every believer with that same Holy Spirit. Second, when our minds are grounded in the gospel, we will listen to and evaluate teachings with discernment. We will listen to and evaluate teachings with discernment. We start with depending upon the Spirit. We have to enter into this thinking about discerning truth from error first and primarily with dependence upon the Spirit. We can't do it on our own. We need God's help. But then we do have a role to play. The Holy Spirit has a role. We have a role to play. We have to listen to the teachings, and we have to evaluate with discernment. Discernment just means to decide whether something is right or wrong, whether it's truth or whether it's error. Paul writes, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. I think Paul is addressing two extremes that we want to avoid here. But before we look at those extremes, we've got to understand what Paul means by the word prophecies. What is he talking about? Do not despise prophecies. And when we hear the word prophecies, our minds probably jump back to the Old Testament immediately. When we see guys like Isaiah and Daniel and Ezekiel and Samuel, Elijah, these, these prophets of God. The role of a prophet Um, When we think about those prophets, we often think that they told the future. They told what was going to happen in the future. And yes, those prophets did tell the future, but that wasn't the only thing they did. Sometimes we focus on that. They also warned God's people, and they they, they preached God's word to the people, and they helped encourage God's people. Sometimes they gave warnings, sometimes they gave rebuke, sometimes they gave encouragement and and, and gospel news to them about God's love and his faithfulness. They were preachers who also told the future. Now, the New Testament speaks of people having the gift of prophecy. But it doesn't seem to be referring to telling the future as much as to that other role of the prophets, which was exhorting and challenging and encouraging people with truths about God. The gift of prophecy is, I would say, very similar to the gift of preaching. It's a very similar type gift. It's helping people understand what God's word is and and, and speaking that in such a way that it encourages them to obey God's word, which is exactly what the prophets did in the Old Testament. In fact, I think we get a, 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 a good picture of prophecy in 1 Corinthians. Paul gives three, um, three gifts, if you will, and he speaks of knowledge and prophecy and teaching, just like that, in that order, knowledge and prophecy and teaching. In the New Testament church, prophecy right there in the middle of knowledge and teaching. You got prophecy stuck right there in the middle. So prophecy goes right along with knowing the truth about God and teaching and preaching the truth about God. So I think when we see prophecies here in the context of 1 Thessalonians, we should think specifically of someone standing up in the gathering of the church and giving some sort of teaching or exhortation on behalf of God. In a very general sense, we would just say prophecies as teachings, teachings about God. Now, back to the two extremes, okay? We kind of understand what prophecies, uh, what prophecies are. Now, back to the two extremes. What are the two extremes Paul is addressing? The first extreme Paul wants the Thessalonians to avoid is the extreme of rejecting it all. We're just rejecting it all. That was one of the things that was happening in the church here. They we're just rejecting it all. Rejecting prophecies or teachings before you even have a chance to hear them. Paul says, do not despise prophecies. It seems that some people in the church of Thessalonica were shutting themselves off from all teaching. They wouldn't even give it a hearing. Maybe it was out of fear, thinking that they would listen to someone give false teaching and be led astray. And maybe it was out of arrogance, thinking they already knew everything and there was nothing left for them to learn. Maybe it was out of an unhealthy reverence for Paul. They thought, well, Paul, he's up here, and he's the only one that we can listen to. No, that's not true. There are other people that can teach, could teach them God's word. Maybe it was out of convenience, thinking that what the person was teaching was too radical or wasn't what their itching ears wanted to hear. Maybe it was out of a wrong devotion to tradition that they were just not even listening to people who were teaching God's word. A wrong devotion to tradition, thinking that the teaching would overturn traditions that they held near and dear to their hearts, and they didn't want to be moved out of their comfort zones. But regardless of the reason, some of the people here apparently were despising prophecies. They were rejecting teaching without ever giving the person teaching a chance to speak. And church, as I think about this, uh, often when we think about false teaching, we think about the other extreme, which we'll get to in a minute, which is actually believing something that's false, listening to it and believing. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we also don't think about this. There's a way that we could, we could just despise teaching. So how does that happen in our lives today? Well, perhaps you refuse to listen to someone teaching the Bible because what they're saying, even though it's coming from the Bible, is not what is popular or accepted in our culture. So we just despise it. Perhaps you refuse to listen to someone teaching the Bible because what they're saying, even though it's coming from the Bible, is not what you grew up hearing or believing. 
it conflicts with what you've believed all your life, even though what they're saying is out of God's word. So we say, oh, I'm not going to believe that. Perhaps you refuse to listen to someone teaching the Bible simply because you think you know it all or because you don't want to be challenged in your walk with the Lord. You're comfortable. You have a routine. And so you just shut out prophecies. You shut out the word of God before ever listening again because you don't want to be forced out of your comfort zone by the word of God. Paul says, church, do not despise prophecies. Give the, God, the, give the word of God when it's taught a hearing, a listening. But then there is another extreme that we have to avoid as well. If the first extreme was rejecting it all, we don't want to just reject it all before we ever hear it. The other extreme is accepting it all. <laughs> oh, well, it's just, we'll just believe everything that somebody tells us about God. We don't want to do that either. While we don't want to shut our ears to prophecies or teachings about God before we ever hear them, we also want to believe every teaching just because someone claims to be speaking the truth about God. Notice that next command, but test everything. Don't despise prophecies. Listen to them, but test everything. Don't believe everything. Test everything. Test everything. In the context, the word everything, of course, is in reference to prophecies or teaching. The word test, that word test is a, mean, is a, is a word that means to examine or evaluate or prove whether something is genuine or fake. The word is used, that word test is used in 1 Peter uh, to refer to testing gold in fire. Testing gold and fire. You see, if it's fake, if the, if the rock goes through the fire and the gold is fake, then it's not going to stand up to the test of the fire. However, if it's genuine, it will pass the test of the fire. Paul's telling the Thessalonians that while they shouldn't reject all teachings up front without giving them a hearing, they should also test and examine and evaluate all teachings to determine whether what they are hearing is true or false. We see the same word, test, used in 1 John when John is warning believers of false teaching. Let's look at that verse. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. We want to test. But let's ask a very important question here. If gold is passed through fire in order to be tested, what do we pass prophecy or, or teaching through to be tested? In other words, how do we know whether a teaching is true or false? What do, what do we use to, to discern, to decipher what is, what is right and what is wrong when it comes to what people say and claim about God? Church, the purifying fire when it comes to evaluating teaching is the word of God. The purifying fire when, we, when it comes to evaluating teaching is God's word. This is what we want to pass teachings through to determine whether they are true or false. Now, Thessalonians didn't have all of the New Testament like we do, but they did have the Old Testament. They had Paul's letter to them that he's writing, he's writing and sending this letter. And, and, and they probably had, or they, they had his other teachings that he gave them while he was there. They might have had some other of the apostles' teachings. Now, we have the complete written revelation of God. It's called the Bible. And God's word never changes. And thus we have a sure standard against which we can and should measure all teachings. Now, I always have to go to one of my favorite examples in the Bible. I love the Bereans. The Bereans lived just a little south of the Thessalonians. So when Paul went and visited the Thessalonians, he left there and he went south and he spent a little bit of time. I don't think he spent long, but he spent a little bit of time with the Bereans. And they serve as a great example of this, of using God's word as the standard or the measure through which we evaluate teaching. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Paul, Paul has left Thessalonica. He's in Berea now. It says, now these Jews, talking about the Berean Jews, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They, the Bereans, received the word with all eagerness. They were excited. They didn't despise prophecies. They were ready to hear teaching about God. But they were also careful. It says, they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So Paul shows up, he starts teaching them that Jesus is the Messiah, and they didn't go, oh, we don't want to hear this teaching about God. They said, all right, let's listen to it. Then they pulled out their Old Testament, they didn't call them the Old Testament, but that was their scriptures of the Old Testament, and they examined whether or not what Paul was saying lined up with what the word of God said. And of course it did. 
and so they believed what Paul said. Now today, again, we have both the Old Testament and Old Testament and the New Testament. We have the completed Word of God with which to test and evaluate the teachings that we hear. And yet, far too often, Christians just believe whatever they read or whatever they hear a pastor or teacher say simply because that book is labeled a Christian book or because that pastor or teacher claims to be a Christian or references the Bible or works at a church or is on the Christian TV channel or the Christian radio station. Friends, calling something Christian doesn't make it a Christian any more than calling a shiny rock gold makes it gold. It doesn't. It has to be tested. It has to be tested. What matters is whether or not it can pass the test. The rock needs to pass the fire test, and the teaching needs to pass the Bible test. And don't be fooled by someone who says, well, this is what the Holy Spirit told me. I'm just following what the Holy Spirit tells me. Because while the Holy Spirit is our guide when it comes to discerning truth from error, the Holy Spirit always guides us into truth by guiding us into God's Word, not away from God's Word. The Holy Spirit is never going to contradict God's Word. Remember back in those verses, back in John a few minutes ago, we read that little sampling of verses, and I read one from chapter 14 and one from chapter 15 and one from chapter 16. Let me remind you of the one from chapter 16. It said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will guide you into all the truth. Spirit will guide you into all the truth. Now let me jump ahead to chapter 17 and read you one verse. John 17, 17. Jesus is praying now for his disciples, and he says, He's talking to the Father. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Put those two verses together, okay? John 16, 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And then Jesus turns around and says, your word is truth. So if somebody says, well, the Holy Spirit told me such and such, but what they're saying does not come from God's word, then we can assume that the Holy Spirit didn't tell them whatever it is that they're claiming the Holy Spirit told them because the Holy Spirit guides us into truth and the word of God is truth. It doesn't matter how many books a person has sold or if she's a good writer or if what he writes doesn't doesn't line up with God's word, then church, it doesn't pass the test. It doesn't matter how long that song has been sung in churches or how cool the music sounds or how high it reached in the Christian music charts, if the lyrics do not align with God's word, then it doesn't pass the test. It doesn't matter how great of a speaker the pastor is or how big his church is or how many views sermons get on the internet. If what he says does not align with God's word, then it doesn't pass the test. As Christians, we've been saved by the truth. We serve the God of truth. And church, we ought to love the truth and hate what is false when it comes to the things of God. And thus, we ought to be quick to evaluate whether all teachings line up or don't line up with God's word. And listen, remember the first point. We don't have to do this by ourselves. We have the Holy Spirit to help us. Let me ask one more question. Let me ask one more question in regards to this. Well, I'll probably ask a few more questions. Y'all know I like to ask a lot of questions. Why, why then, if that's the case, why, if we have God's word, if we have the Holy Spirit, why then do so many Christians get led astray by false teaching? They do. They do. Maybe it's just a little bit off track. Sometimes it's way off track. But why do so many Christians get led astray by false teaching? Well, probably a lot of reasons. Let me, let me narrow it down to maybe one of two things, or maybe it's a combination of both of these things. Think about it this way. Not being led astray requires, if everything that I've said is true so far, okay, in regards to the Spirit and the Bible, and, and we've got to use our minds to, to read and all that. See if you agree with me on this. I think this is true. Not being led astray, then, requires knowing the Bible well and taking the time to think well about whatever it is you are hearing or listening to, being taught or sung or, or what you're reading in a book. It requires knowing the Bible well and taking the time to think well which means that those who are led astray probably either don't know God's word well or they know God's word, but they're lazy with their minds when it comes to listening to teaching, whether in the form of a book or a song or a sermon, or perhaps it's a combination of both. They don't know God's word well, and they leave their minds at the door when they walk in to hear a teaching or they open up a book that claims to be a Christian book. Friends, too often we have lazy minds instead of discerning minds. It's really the burden of my heart when it comes to this passage before us today. Too often we have lazy minds instead of discerning minds. We don't take the time and put in the energy to study God's word and know what it is that what is there. 
And when we open a book or sing a song or listen to a sermon, we leave our minds at the door and we just accept whatever that person is saying is truth just because they, they, they say that they're a Christian or they reference a few Bible verses. Now, I've heard Christians say, well, I'm not a deep thinker. I've heard Christians say that. Well, I'm not a deep thinker. I, I can't think deeply about those kinds of things. And what they're referring to are things about God. Things about God. I had my mind. I just can't think deeply about those things. And yet those same people can tell you everything you ever wanted to know and what you even didn't want to know about sports stats and players and teams and who's who and what's what. They could quickly correct a person who said something that was untrue regarding last year's draft or yesterday's trade deal or tomorrow's lineup, but they say they can't think deeply about the things of God in order to be ready to recognize and correct false teaching when they hear it. And so when they tell me that, I just, I go, yeah, right. You just don't want to. It's not that you can't, you just don't want to because you think deeply about all sorts of other things. Sometimes it's sports. I'm just using that one as an example. Sometimes it's hunting and fishing. Sometimes it's politics. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it's food. Sometimes it's the latest technology. Sometimes it's current world events. Sometimes it's you fill in the blank with whatever it is you're passionate about. It's not that we don't know how to think deeply. We just pick and choose what we want to think deeply about. And often when it comes to the things of God, we're lazy with our minds. Brothers and sisters, at best, that is the sin of laziness, and at worst, that is the sin of idolatry. We could say that Paul is calling on the believers here in this passage to worship God with their minds. In fact, worshiping God with our minds is a part of the greatest commandment in Scripture. When, when asked what the greatest commandment was, you know what Jesus said? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Mind. Church, we're not loving God with our minds when we're lazy in our study of Scripture and lazy in our evaluation of teachings. Think about it this way. If you love food, you will think carefully about what you eat. You will evaluate what is good food and what isn't good food. If you love sports, you will think carefully about which team to pull for. You will evaluate which teams are good and, and which are not. I'm not going to make any jokes, okay? I'm not going to do that. You pull for whoever you want to pull for. If you, if, you, if you love a musical artist, okay, if you love a certain mu musical artist, then you'll think carefully about the music. You'll use that singer as the standard by which you evaluate all other music. You say, well, it's good, but it's not as good as her. It's not as good as him. If you love God, if you love God, you'll think carefully about every claim you hear about God. You'll evaluate everything you hear about God to see if it aligns with what God says about God. And church, this is a matter of worship. It's a very small step between love and worship. Because often what we love is what we worship. And so this is a matter of worship. This is a call to worship, to worship God with our minds by having our minds grounded in the unchanging gospel, found in the unchanging word of God so that we remain unchanged in our belief in the truth. I got another question for you. This question is going to lead us to our third truth for us today. What do we do then once we have done this? Once we have depended upon the Spirit and listened to and evaluated the teaching to see whether it's right or wrong, what comes next? What comes next? What well, leads to the third and final way we want to worship God with minds grounded in the gospel? Church, when our minds are grounded in the gospel, we will, number three, respond to teachings with either full acceptance or full rejection. We will respond to teachings with either full acceptance or full rejection. We depend on the Spirit, we listen and evaluate, and then we either fully accept or we fully reject. The second half of verse 21 and then into verse 22 says, Hold fast what is good, abstain from what is evil. Hold fast what is good, abstain from what is evil. This last point is simple, but it is very, very crucial. While the previous point was about avoiding extremes, right? We don't want to go into the extreme of rejecting all prophecies. We don't want to go to the extreme of just believing everything without, without evaluating it. Here, we do want to go to the extremes. Once we have discerned, according to God's word, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, what is true from what is false, we want to run quickly to one of two extremes. We want to either fully accept the teaching if it is right and it is true or we want to fully reject the teaching if it does not align with God's word the word good in verse 21 doesn't mean like it has a good result something good comes from it but it's talking about good in its essence like pure 
like a metal coin. This, this word was often used for a metal coin being either good or counterfeit. The essence of it is good. If it's good, we hold fast to it. What does it mean to hold fast? Well, it means to actively hold on to something. I'll, this is, this is what, I, what I, when I see the words hold fast in Scripture, I always think about wrapping your arms around something really tight and not letting it go, no matter what happens. That, that's that hold fast. It's an active holding on. It's not like I'm holding on to it by like putting it in my pocket. No, I'm, I'm holding it, but I'm not really actively holding on to it. To hold fast to something means I've, I've latched on to it and I'm not letting it go. If it is good teaching, if it is teaching that comes from God's word, then we latch on to it and we don't let it go. We accept it fully. We believe it and we live by it. And this seems obvious. You think, Zach, this seems like a super simple point. But here's the thing, church. There may be times when a teaching is true and yet we find it hard to fully accept it. Perhaps the teaching is different than what we were raised believing, or maybe it's not popular in our society, and yet we find it to be true according to God's word, and then we have to make a decision. Do I accept it as the truth that it is because it's in God's word, or do I disregard it because it's not what I've always believed or or it's not what society deems as acceptable? Let me give you an example of this. I was talking with a pastor um, uh, a while back, and, uh, and he, was, he was telling me about a young girl that he had led to faith in Christ. And, and she, had, she had come to the church there, and, and she had, didn't grow up in a Christian home, and she trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation. Not long after she had believed in Jesus for salvation, the pastor was preaching through a book of the Bible and came to a section regarding the roles of men and women in the home and in the church. And what the Bible taught concerning the different roles of men and women conflicted with how she was raised and what she had been taught in her home growing up. And it wasn't that she thought that the pastor was teaching what was false. She realized that the pastor was simply teaching what the word of God said. It was very clear. And yet she had a decision to make. She had to decide whether or not she would hold fast to this good teaching, which was the opposite of what she had grown up believing. That's just one example Let me ask you, is there a biblical teaching that you're tempted to not hold fast to? Is there a biblical teaching that you're tempted not to grab a hold of and fully accept? Maybe you're tempted to not hold fast to the clear teaching of Scripture that hell is real and eternal, not just an illusion. Or that Jesus is the only way to heaven and not one of many ways. Or that homosexuality is a sin, not just an alternative lifestyle. Or that God is wrathful, not just loving. Or that the Intentional killing of unborn babies is murder, not reproductive health care. Or that all Christians are to live on mission, not just those who are called to be missionaries. Or that husbands are to be the loving and leading head of the home, not the wives. Or that believing in Jesus often brings suffering, not earthly health, wealth, and happiness. Now why did I pick those? Well, because all of those are clear teachings of Scripture that are not popular in our world. And so when we see that they are good, that is, they are genuine, they are true t- the true teaching of God's Word, then we have to decide to hold fast to them, to fully accept them, no matter what anyone else says. But the other side of the coin is just as important. While we fully accept what is good, we fully reject everything that is false, that is not good. It says that we must abstain from every form of evil. Of course, that could be taken in a very general sense. We should abstain from all sinfulness, from, from all evil, all wickedness. But again, I think the context would lead us to view this as specifically referring to evil teaching or evil prophecies. If the teaching does not align with God's word, then it's not merely false, but it is evil. And if it is evil, then we need to run to the other extreme. We abstain from it. We don't, we don't just stop holding fast to it, but kind of hold on a little bit, keep it in our pocket, touch it a little bit. We run the other way. We abstain from it. To abstain is a very strong word. It means to have nothing to do with it. If the book contains false teaching, then we don't believe it. If the song lyrics are not faithful to Scripture, then we don't sing it. If the sermon is not an accurate explanation of God's Word, then we turn it off. Or we confront the pastor. Or in some cases, you get up and leave. If it's good, you embrace it. If it's evil, then you have nothing to do with it. It's that simple, and yet it's not always that easy. And so, church, we need to depend upon the Holy Spirit. Back to where we started. We can't do it on our own. 
We need the help of the Holy Spirit. We depend upon Him. And we only have the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. Church, our minds must remain grounded in the gospel. But our minds can't be grounded in the gospel if we've never believed the gospel. And so if you don't want to be led astray into false teachings about God, then the first thing that has to happen is you've got to believe the truth that Jesus came to die for your sins and rescue you. And you've got to believe in him for salvation. And then and only then will your mind become grounded in gospel truth and the spirit of truth fill your heart and mind. And church, when our minds are grounded in the gospel, we will not quench the spirit. Instead, we will listen and evaluate and either accept or reject according to God's word. And when our minds are grounded in the gospel in this way, you know what will happen? We will be worshiping God with our minds. We're living lives worshiping God with our minds. And when we as the church are a gathering of gospel worship, hearts transformed by the gospel, minds grounded in the gospel, then God will be honored because we will be shining the gospel light brightly to a dark world around us. Church, you may never heard this before, but you're going to hear it today. Don't leave your minds at the door. Don't leave your minds at the door. A healthy church is filled with members who worship God with minds grounded in the gospel. And so church, let's be a gathering of gospel worship. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I, I, love, I, love, I love thinking about discerning truth from error because we have your word. How hopeless would this, this task of discerning truth from error be if you had not given us your word and yet you have? But Father, the problem often is that we are lazy in our study of your word. And we're lazy when it comes to evaluating and listening with discernment teachings, whether they're in the form of a book or a sermon or a song that claims to be Christian. Father, we, we must be a people who think well. We must put our thinking caps on, Father, and leave them on. And yet it's not just about us and our own ability to doing that. But, Father, you have also given us your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into the truth of your word so that as we study your word and as we depend upon your spirit, Father, you will lead us away from that which is false and into that which is true. Father, you will help us be able to point out false teaching and steer ourselves and others away from it and into the goodness and the riches of your word. Father, would you help us in this? Father, help us to worship you with minds grounded in the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to worship the Lord together. We're going to sing some truths about God's word. And so let's respond to God, this passage of scripture in song today. My faith has found a resting place, God can devise your cream. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall bleed. I need no other argument, I need no my dear 
says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, You are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. My glory rejoices. My flesh will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. We can rest on the rock of Jesus and his word as our cornerstone. Let's sing this morning. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Worship the Lord today. Amen. Let's go out, continuing to worship Him with hearts transformed by the gospel and with minds grounded on the gospel. Let's put our thinking caps on, church, and live with them on. You are dismissed. <laughs>